uh, well, can we start now? I'll introduce very briefly because I don't want to eat into already the, the sort of dinner time after this. Uh, Anne Tyler and uh, Lisa Kim Davis, uh, to uh, the two very interesting uh, presentations. We sort of come back to what we started with, uh, especially uh, building on uh, uh, Stefan's arguments. Of these so uh, what we'll do is we'll have half an hour um, for both of you and then followed by about 20 minutes of uh, uh, question and answers at the end of both of the two uh, presentations. Yeah. And I'll give you a kind of five minute warning. Okay, I think I cut short this presentation because we are behind the schedule. But I follow Stefan because uh, for the original call, this was a memory of Neil Smith, and I, every time I had a chance to talk about the rent theory, I understand for Neil Smith, of course, it was the concept of rent scan. So, um, I, I put a little um, subtitle here. The, the original idea was to talk about this uh, rent gap debate, but also It's a quite a dangerous, but <laughs> well, <clears throat> well, luckily the uh, the first presentation discussed Neil Smith, but completely different angle. So, 1974, uh, Neil Smith, uh, in in an article toward the theory of gentrification, back to the city movement by capital, not people, explained or presented an explanation on gentrification and introduced the rent cap theory. So this rent cap theory, although Neil Smith introduced that to English speaking audience, it's uh, not exactly his idea. So the, the idea has been around for a long time and also explicitly in the German discussion, there was this concept previously, Neil Smith, but he, he brought that to English speaking discussion. And so what, was this concept of, of uh, rent was, of course, this um, abstract theoretical concept of rent, rent as a social relation, and uh, also connected to the power of landowners and connected to the inequality. And this is important to, this, this was the concept uh, also understood by Neil Smith, and this is the different concept that the critics were using. And so, um, so briefly, just to restate this difference, so in, in you, you can say that uh, rent is a theoretical concept, an abstract concept, and it has a manifestation forms, rise, land price, and the rental payment or contract rent. So they are different thing, and they, there lies the power of the explanation power of the rent cap theory because it moves in the different level. Oh, I think uh, uh, Stefan was talking about different scales. So it's also explaining I incentives or initiatives by, by landowners, but also this uh, as uh, general movement of capital. So uh, they are in, in explanation these different levels of abstract levels. And <clears throat> so what uh, how Neil Smith defined these concepts. First, the rent cap is a disparity between the potential ground rent level and the actual ground rent capitalized under the present land use. And <clears throat> I have underlined here, a colored red, some of the important points. So first, it's an important to understand that land has an multiple uses, alternative uses, and that is brought with this concept of potential ground rent. And also he is using the term ground rent. So not to confuse that in, in economics today, rent means completely different thing. <coughs> and, and these other citations by, by Smith, this is you to pay attention after when I discuss the critics against Neil Smith. So gentrification occurs 
when the gap is wide enough that the developers can purchase sales cheaply. So they should act as developers. Once the rent gap is wide enough, gentrification may be initiated in a given neighborhood by several different actors. So he's talking about several different actors in the land and housing market. And gentrification is a structural product <coughs> of land and housing market. And this is very important because he brought to the explanation of gentrification land and housing market. And I really can't understand how that could be <laughs> independent of land and housing market. So why gentrification and not taking that explanation in that to account. And gentrification is, uh, is a back to the city movement of capital rather than people. And so here, here are these uh, different scales. So what was the context of this uh, rent gap theory? So it was uh, criticism against these demand side explanations of gentrification and consumer sovereignty, especially the Sharon Zuking and all, all these uh, when gentrification has been explained as a middle class movement, uh, effect of the taste, change of the, state, the taste. And <clears throat> so it, it was a criticism against that. And but what was quite strange was the severe attack and criticism against this quite natural idea that gentrification has something to do with land development and developers. So I, I will briefly mention some of these uh, criticism against the Smith theory. So Robert Beauregard in 1984, and now if, if you remember the aspects of Neil Smith, several actors, developers, and so on, so Robert Beauregard argued that in order to explain gentrification, one needs to refer to several forces, not only one factor. And I'm, I'm not, of course, gentrification is this multifaceted problem, but what rent cap theory did was to abstract one important causal mechanism or reason. And I'm, I'm not quite convinced that if the good explanation is to collect as many factors as as possible. And rent cap is only one of the necessary conditions for gentrification. Okay, no, no one, Smith didn't deny that. He never argued that. And it's difficult to perceive potential ground rent. And the, here comes now this misunderstanding of this rent as an abstract concept. If you can't perceive that, that doesn't exist. So what is then in a way the and I, uh, of course, this is an old paper by Bob, but Bob is a very good friend of mine, and I, I really don't like to present this, but, but, but this is a big difference. So, and I think, uh, I, I have noticed that German fellows, they really understand this difference between form and manifestation forms, but mo mostly some Anglo-American uh, countries, they, they don't accept that something that you don't observe or perceive doesn't exist. But I think here, in, in, uh, again, this whole idea, the concept is, is misinterpreted. So Rose 84, gentrifiers are not the mere bearers of process determined independently. Again, this is uh, not, <coughs> not what Smith uh, intended. And, Chris Hamnet, 1991, in Smith's thesis, individual, this is basically the same as Rose. Gentrifiers are merely the passive handmaidens of capital requirements. Smith's tendency to dismiss the role of individual gentrifiers in favor of collective social actors. And in the <coughs> still uh, language of the time, or maybe after that, rent cap theory is underdetermined. Renewable deterioration, abandonment could also occur. Rent cap theory focus on the production of the built environment. Again, this is uh, Neil Smith was talking about several actors and uh, also gentrification. He, he was he was protesting this idea of uh, urban cowboys and frontier that you they find this uh, this American vocabulary. And <coughs> David Lay. Interestingly, 86, 87, it's appreciated that you try to operationalize the abstract concept, but he did it in a way that he was um, identifying rent in the housing market, 
completely forgetting the land market. And I think that, that was also only just one part of the main point of Ms. Smith's idea was to connect that to the land market phenomena. And then also this, again, this abstract concept and manifestation form. So he talked only rental payments and prices, not land values, not to talk about abstract concept. And then he came to the conclusion that all that is now required for gentrification to occur is the potential for profits. And that is quite a strange uh, interpretation of Neil Smith's theory. And in the debate that followed, David Lay was in a way uh, understood to present a cultural explanation and Smith for economic explanation. And these, these camps of uh, debate were were separated. And if it's, it's quite amazing if somebody is presenting a theory that, hey, look the gentrification, you look land market, you look developers, you look landowners. There's a severe criticism against that. So nobody criticized that the demand side explanations are one-sided. Hey, you forget this and this. And so just to <coughs> summarize this, the critics argued that um, rent cap is only one condition, difficult to perceive, dismisses the role of a gentrifiers, reducing <coughs> the just potential for profit. And also some of the critics argued that it doesn't explain when and where gentrification happened. And this is also quite strange type of criticism. And <coughs> so in, in 2006, Tom Slater in, in a, quite an important article in, in gentrification debate, the eviction of critical perspective from gentrification research in international journal, uh, wanted to argue why this critical criticism has disappeared in gentrification debate. So just to uh, illustrate that people or researchers tended to regard if neighborhood get a lot there, that it's a good neighborhood that's an upgrading. So, he was, he was asking that, and uh, he presented several reasons, but one of the reasons was that, <laughs> that he argued that rent cap debate, and also I, I really appreciate Tom Slatter's work, but I, I don't quite accept this point that rent cap debate was important in 1970s and 80s, but not anymore, so nobody's anymore interested of the debate between. The critical perspectives, this is citation, perspective get lost within the scabbling about whether Smith or Lay has got it right. So let's forget this debate. And I think, again, this, this, is, uh, this is very strange. And <clears throat> does it mean the eviction of the rent cap explanation? And if I look, what, if I look the long history so <clears> of <throat> rent debate, so the discussion of rent, it appears and then it disappears. It comes up again. And it always has been connected to some social current problems. So in uh, British Parliament in the beginning of 19th century, there was a big debate of corn taxes. And capitalists argued that taxes are bad. We want to sheep grain. And Ricardo wanted to defend the point and develop the theory of land rent or differential rent. End of the 19th century, the issue was poverty. Marx and Henry George introduced the concepts of uh, land rent. And uh, Henry George, the single, single tax idea, the reforming the whole society. In the 1970s, there, there was a global housing bubble. And especially in the, in the Germany, there was a very interesting rent debate in the 1970s, but, uh, but also in, in uh, Anglo-American French literature. And then in the 1980s, there was also, again, this kind of global real estate boom. And that developed, again, new concept of, uh, of rent. David, David Harvey introduced this idea, land as a financial asset. Again, this made a boost. But then, again, rent debate, rent. De and I, I have big, because I'm, I'm fascinated of rent theory, and I'm wondering why people find it so disgusting, or I don't know what. What's wrong with rent theory? And so this is the most recent issue in International Journal of Urban and Regional Research by David Lay and Sin Yitil. 
So it's, it's now online, it's going to be published. So gentrification in Hong Kong, epistemology versus ontology. And in this paper they ask, or they claim that the, the word gentrification is missing in Hong Kong. They look for the South China Morning Post and, and Chinese newspapers and public debate and they argue that it's missing. They ask why. So why this term gentrification is missing? There's a lot of discussion about redevelopment. There's a lot of discussion of evictions and so on. But why this word gentrification? I'm not quite sure whether it's an interesting, because I, I guess languages are differently open to this kind of neologism. But, but anyway, they <laughs> introduce a very interesting explanation. They argue that the tenacious culture of property in Hong Kong has obscured the working of familiar set of class relations in the housing market, relations satisfactory described by the concept of gentrification. So they argue that because in Hong Kong there is a culture of property, whatever is culture of property, I think again this is an interesting issue, but because of this culture of property there is no word of gentrification. Even more, they, they have did, did some interviews in Hong Kong, uh, planners, economists and so on, and, uh, and people, and they argue that uh, people in Hong Kong are more interested in compensations rather than evictions. And all, they, they really say all Hong Kong people have real estate business as a hobby. And uh, uh, there, there are many Hong Kong people now in the audience. I would be very much like to hear your response of this, because this, again, David, David Lee was um, introduced as a kind of a advocate for the cultural explanation in this debate with uh, Neil Smith, proposing economic explanation. Now he is uh, introducing the concept of cultural property. So is, is that coming back to rent cap? Or is that, again, this culture explanation? And what, what on earth is this culture of property? So <clears throat> during the lunch break, I, I heard that uh, Hong Kong people love Singapore. And when, when you think of how good this explanation is, is to Hong Kong, so I, I would like to say some words about Singapore, because I, I, have, where I have done a lot of work. And <clears throat> so. I, I would like to argue that definitely there is some kind of cultural property in Singapore. And I have, I have used, I have not used the word cultural property, but I have used two concepts, property state and property mind. And <clears throat> first this property mind, what I mean by property mind, for example in, in novels, one novel by Darren Shee, Heartland. So in Singapore these uh, public housing neighborhoods really working class neighborhoods are called heartlands. So again, this is an interesting phenomenon concerning the language. But in, in this novel by Xiao, there is a fifth uncle, and the, he comes from Malaysia and to Singapore and, uh, and the, uh, he, to visit Ving and his, his mar mother, Li. And the fifth uncle has calculated the value of the flat and said, okay, it's 300,000 Singaporean dollars. That's half a million ringgit. If you sell your home and move to Malaysia, put the money to the bank, you live wonderfully the rest of your life. And even if you go to Australia, you can make a good living. Again, uh, this, this is what, what I, I think a good example of uh, thinking of, uh, of just property and uh, real estate business as a hobby, not as a home, investing, not, a, not buying a place to, to live. And economists call this an opportunity cost. And <clears throat> I, I have done some interviews with uh, property investors in, in Singapore. And if you read the literature, there's this idea that overseas Chinese want to buy a piece of their homeland, and that's why they native village, they invest there. But I, I haven't met that kind of Singaporean investors. I, I have several times invest, uh, interviewed Mr. Chen. It's not really his name, but he's ethnic Chinese, and uh, he's, he's uh, really a kind of a calculative, uh, property-oriented investor. Just even he, once I visited 
his, his home, he showed me calculations of his home. If he sealed it now, would it be good? So no sentiments to, to home. And I, I call this to, <clears throat> I, I don't know whether this is a proper translation of Marx, but character mask. So do you do that, uh, use that in English language? But <clears throat> he's really a kind of, uh, and <clears throat> just to look this, what, what I mean by this property state, these institutions and rules that make people. It's not, I, I, I don't want to argue that it's the quality of Chinese or Hong Kong or Singapore people to invest in property or to think of property. But what is more interesting and possible to, to give proof if whether there are some institution and rules in the society that incite people to behave in that way. And definitely in Singapore there are a lot. Like, <coughs> and 86% of the people in, or Singaporeans live in public housing. And what is unusual and very different than public housing in Hong Kong is that uh, Singaporeans can own the public housing and they can sell the public housing unit in the resale market. It's public housing because it's built on the public land, it's subsidized by the public authority and it's developed by the public authority. But they can sell and like in Hong Kong, I understand that if your, your income is increasing higher, you are kicked out from the public housing. But in, in Singapore, it's in, in a way encouraged to people to accumulate wealth through public housing. And I have been thinking this a lot. And because in, in most of the Western countries, the public housing or social housing model fails just because they, they create separate housing careers. And then when there's a cycles in the housing market than in those in the public sector or social sector they are entrapped. But in Singapore that's not the case and I, again this, this is a hard idea to accept but uh, it seems to be functioning. So the, again this is one institutional mechanism that make people very property oriented in Singapore. The home ownership rate I think this is the highest in the world is 87%. In the cities this is really the highest figure. But then uh, quite new legislation they introduced called end block le legislation. So if you take a condominium or this <coughs> what, what in the United States is called condominium and you have a joint ownership of the building. So they introduced the legislation in Singapore that if, uh, <coughs> if a majority decide to sell the house for the developer it goes despite the minority votes. And <clears throat> so I think the, this again, and uh, Singaporean scholars have calculated that this kind of collective sale is more profitable than selling by individual pieces. Again, these kind of uh, elements in the society and, and institutions, I think, encourage people to invest in, in property. So I think I, I'll stop here. Thanks.